Hi, everyone. Welcome, people who are joining. Welcome, everyone. Live webinar from uh, Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. My name is Jay Shofet, here with you this evening as I usually am every other Sunday, Sunday, 8 p.m. Israel time, one in the afternoon uh, Eastern time, and uh, moving on from there. Welcome, everybody. We'd love to uh, hear from you in the chat. Let us know where you're hailing from, where you're calling in from. Um, always appreciate it. We got a great webinar tonight on uh, Israel's, well, we called them rivers originally, but uh, apparently they're Mediterranean climate streams. It's a term I just became familiar with and I like it a lot. Uh, it seems to be pretty descriptive. Um, thank you, thank you, people are joining. Uh, we're up to 70, 70 people already and I assume Avi we're live on Facebook. My name is Jay Shofit. I'm a uh, director yes, of- Yes, we are. Thanks, Avi, Director of Development for uh, SPNI, Echevra Laganata Teva, here calling uh, with you from my home in Tel Aviv. Uh, Professor Gazid is with us from his home, presumably, uh, next to the a lovely river in Israel, I can see, uh, right out of his backyard, right in his window there. That's amazing property he's got. It's, he's got a porch overlooking the thing. <laughs> Avi's in, no, no, Avi Tana. Um, uh, um, uh, Avi, Avi Sadiv in Toronto, the executive director of Canadian SPNI, uh, usually with us uh, on these Sundays as well, doing back office. Thank you so much, Avi. Appreciate it and appreciate CSPNI lending you out. Uh, it's uh, been an opportunity to thank all of our board members, our uh, dedicated volunteers in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, and in France, and our staff in the UK, in the, in the, the US and in Canada. Uh, thank you guys very much for support year round and, and uh, whenever we need it and uh, being there, we appreciate it very, very much. <clears throat> yeah, we feel like uh, just one more way that SPNI is a uh, truly a global organization. And in fact, uh, as we know and have learned many times in these webinars, nature's no, nature knows no boundaries and uh, we can't afford to, we can't afford to know boundaries in the natural world. So, uh, so thank you. Welcome everybody coming in from uh, California and from New Jersey and Toronto and uh, Beersheba and Brooklyn and uh, the British Columbia, Beersheba, Netherlands, London, Tel Aviv, the DC area, one of my favorite areas, Sacramento, Altamonte Springs, Florida, not a place I know. Hello, Carol. Uh, Larchmont, uh, Naples, Florida, Hyde Park, Chicago, London. Hi, Daniel. I'll be doing a webinar uh, personally for Daniel's congregation in London uh, in a few weeks. And um, hello, hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Shalom, and uh, maybe we will be getting to the uh, I think we should get to the webinar. We're at three minutes after the hour. Welcome the people who have uh, joined lately up. We're up to 100 people and counting. So people are still coming in, Avital. I think we'll wait another minute or two and uh, let everybody hear the beginning of the webinar. Um, welcome to, um, to our probably about our 44th or 45th webinar in our series we've been doing every couple of weeks with a summer hiatus. Here at SPNI, uh, our English language webinars, trying to bring to you the best of Israeli nature, not just the best and the beautiful, but sometimes the problems and the challenges, and uh, how we can overcome them. That's what uh, that's what tonight's webinar is about. I'm very excited to hear. Um, my name is Jay Shofit, coming to you from Tel Aviv. For those who have just joined um, from SPNI in Tel Aviv, SPNI is a uh, um, works throughout Israel, uh, 40 different end units, depending on how you count them, all throughout the country. Um, and uh, we deal with a variety of issues, all relating to nature conservation and protection and uh, sustainability issues, biodiversity throughout Israel uh, and throughout the Middle East. So uh, thanks everybody for joining, appreciate it very much. Thank you all our uh, 
to our supporters from all around the world and all of you who are coming in. Uh, hey, Sandra from the Cincinnati, home of the Cincinnati Bengals. Go Joe Burrow. I'm rooting for the Cinderella team of the league in the NFL Super Bowl tonight at uh, at uh, one in the morning Israel time, early earlier than usual. So um, anyway, thank you guys. Welcome to this webinar. We're going to get moving now. Um, thank Avi Sadiv uh, in Toronto for back office help. We're pushing towards 120 people uh, on the Zoom and another probably another couple dozen on Facebook. So uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody, and welcome. Uh, looking very much forward to learning about Israel's rivers, uh, or as uh, Professor Gazit has called them in our title when we were discussing it, Mediterranean climate streams. For me personally, somebody who grew up in upstate New York, I never was comfortable calling them rivers. I'm sorry, they're just, they're, 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 they're not even streams or brooks or creeks. They're just something different. And Mediterranean climate streams, I, I'm really liking that. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm very anxious to hear more about it. So um, I'll let Professor Gazit introduce himself. I'll just say that Professor Gazit, uh, Avital Gazit is a professor at Tel Aviv University. And uh, he's a board member of the Hebra Lagarat Teva, the Society of the Protection of Nature here in Israel. And uh, Appreciate very much being with uh, that you're with us here tonight. So thank you, uh, Professor Gazit. He'll talk for about 40, 45 minutes. And if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer box. Uh, and uh, we will uh, round them up and I'll, I'll, I'll ask him the questions at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, it's my turn now. It is, go for it. Okay, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be with you for the second time, dear friends. And uh, while the name appears on the chat, I noticed there is a friend of mine, colleague David Firth. So hi, David. <laughs> um, anyway, I am, for the last 10 years, uh, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Zoology, and now it's called the School of Zoology. But I was active for the last 10 years heading the uh, master research program at the School uh, of Environment, the Porter School of Environment. And my expertise is the aquatic ecology, uh, lake, I don't say lakes because on one, uh, lakes, streams, uh, rain pools, et cetera. Last time I lectured to you on rain pools, this time I will focus on streams. And I, uh, what I think I should do is I should share the screen and we should start. Just let me know if uh, you see clearly and it's a yes, full it's screen. fine. <clears throat> yes, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the title is Can Israel Rivers Be Saved? By, by this title, you already understand that there is a problem uh, rehabilitating Mediterranean climate streams. Uh, I just want to take your attention to the bottom. I, may, I thought I should uh, uh, take a copyright on Tel Aviv Universality as a, a nice mistake. Um, okay, let's start. So first clarification, why streams? What about rivers? So streams, as Jay already mentioned, we, we, had the, we have the Jordan River, which is on the scale of stream in other countries. And we had the Arcon River, uh, which is now um, on our scale, may, still be called a river, all the rest are really streams and brooks. The other clarification is why Mediterranean was a small M and not Mediterranean was a capital M. And uh, the, the reason is uh, as follows. There are five Mediterranean climate regions in the world uh, that I believe that you know the largest is the Mediterranean basin. And then we have the California, Mediterranean climate, we have in Chile, the Santiago area, we have in South Africa, the Cape, and of course, Australia at first, all these are the same, uh, about the same latitude, south and uh, north and south uh, of um, the equator, and they all have a similar climate. And therefore, what is interesting, although they are widely separated, the ecosystems show biological similarities. We will not talk about these similarities today. We will focus on uh, Mediterranean climate streams, which are 
found in all these um, areas. So Mediterranean is not Mediterranean. When we say Mediterranean with capital, we mean Mediterranean basin. Mediterranean is uh, the character of being in a Mediterranean climate with a small n. And in short, we call them med rivers, although they, they are streams. Okay, so what are the drivers of stream biodiversity in general? Um, we talk about the climatic and geomorphic setting. Geomorphic is the topography and the soil, the setting in the different location, different uh, part of the world that you are. And therefore it affects the rainfall it affects the landscape and environmental condition in each place and the nutrients. These are the minerals that plants require for their growth. And, and we specifically focus on this because they affect tremendously the quality of the water. And then rainfall and uh, landscape uh, together determine the hydrology, meaning the flow pattern of streams <clears throat> Rainfall and nutrients determine the nutrient load, how much um, kilograms uh, of uh, nitrogen or phosphorus enter the system. All those three together determine what we call the stream abiotic features. When we say abiotic, we mean physical chemical uh, features of the streams. They are not biological. These in turn affect the biotic structure meaning the animals and plants that are in the system. And those um, uh, in turn affect the abiotic condition. For instance, the concentration of oxygen, activity of algae will increase the oxygen in the water. Now, the current reality of Israel's flowing waters, this is our issue today. Now, in general, we have to say, unfortunately, that many of the streams are altered. Saying altered is really a soft word. Uh, this is by direct human impact. Uh, we, the Israelis, by water diversion and or pollution. And indirect is uh, human impact, which is a global effect, not necessarily us, the Israelis. It's the climate change that you are all familiar with. And we will not focus on this um, in this lecture. Now, the outcome is a decline of flow and water quality in the streams, loss of biodiversity of plants and animals, and decline of stream in general, what we call stream health. A healthy stream is a functioning stream that uh, uh, from year to year uh, has a, a healthy biodiversity. Now, this is the, um, on the right side, you see the structure that we talked before. Now, what is the human impact? Of course, global warming affects the climate uh, and via the climate rainfall and nutrients and every other earth, uh, else. Pollution affects, in this case, uh, the nutrient content. A diversion and regulation by, by dams, for instance, determine the flow of the water, the hydrograph. And there's also habitat modification by strengthening the, 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 morpho the morphology of the stream, uh, then we change the structure of the stream. This is habitat modification. And uh, community modification is introduction of foreign species, um, all the story of invent, uh, invasion of plant and animals and uh, the travels they make. Now, all these together, are really the rehabilitation targets. This is what we want to solve. The pollution, the diversion, the habitat modification, the, and the community modification. So in general, we can say that med rivers are multi-pressured or multi-stressed ecosystem. It's not one problem. It's a, a compounded effect of many problems. Of these, pollution and diversion are the most important. Now, loss of biodiversity, here I'll show you some invertebrates, aquatic invertebrates uh, that we have in our system, is a, a major effect. And I want to explain to you um, how this works. There are sensitive species, particularly 
particularly those requiring high flow of water and high dissolved oxygen level, and they will be eliminated. And you see here two creatures that these extensions are really their gills. This is a caddis fly, and this is a mayfly. You see the gills, and it tells us that they require um, uh, strong currents and high concentration of oxygen. In turn, the tolerant species take over, uh, it, particularly those that are resistant to low flow and to low dissolved oxygen. And the reason that they're uh, resistant to low dissolved oxygen sh is shown in the picture. This is not a worm. This is a larva of a midge of uh, Chironomus. And the red coloring is hemoglobin that we have in our uh, blood cells. Uh, they have the hemoglobin in their fluid, in their body fluid. And their hemoglobin uh, at, uh, attaches oxygen much stronger than ours. Therefore, they can survive in much lower oxygen conditions. This is a worm we call tubifex worm. Those that have aquaria know that they feed the fish with these worms. Uh, they also are found when the dissolved oxygen is extremely low, and they also have uh, hemoglobin in the fluid of their body. And the carp, which is a, a tolerant species that if, are found in streams and lakes where, uh, that are mostly polluted and have low oxygen. Now, in addition, there is loss of ecosystem services. I, I'm not sure how, uh, how many of you and how much you know about ecosystem services, so bear with me if I talk about things that you already know. Um, I try to explain that. Let's look at this picture at the bottom and imagine that this is a cross section of a stream and you see fish and you see all kinds of creatures and interactions that take it takes place in this system. So there is a biodiversity and ecosystem interactions. They are responsible to benefits that the human being um, benefit from the ecosystems. And we uh, combine them in a, a category of services that they provide for human well being. This is um, provisioning, cultural, and regulation. You are most familiar with cultural, which is boating, recreation, uh, even uh, religious, if it's the Jordan River with the Christian coming to uh, dip in the, in the river. Uh, provisioning is food, and in our case also water, and regulation, uh, it could be flood control for, uh, for example. Now, human uh, activity uh, produces um, what we call drivers of change. And one of them is pollution. And if this pollution affects the system, we lose all the services, the good services the ecosystem provide us. So this is a concept that was introduced about 15 years ago, mostly to talk with decision makers uh, to explain to them why we need to uh, maintain biodiversity. And um, this means health of all aquatic uh, systems and also terrestrial systems. So this is the reality of Israeli flowing waters. On the right side, you see uh, very bad conditions. It, the red on the upper picture is not color. This is a bacteria, purple, purple bacteria that developed from the discharge from a uh, meat factory this, the char it, this is not blood. This is organic material where the purple bacteria grow. This is in the Naaman River. On the bottom, the dead fish are in the Alexander Stream. And on the right side, we see uh, the northern rivers that we have, the Hatsbani Sneer. Uh, you see a healthy stream. And there is a great demand for uh, use of this stream in the lower area. Uh, you see the, the crowding of people uh, boating in the stream. Um, so uh, what we want to is to change the condition from the right to the left. And what I'll tell you, unfortunately, that 
although we are not doomed, uh, it's not an easy task to say the least. So this is Israel precipitation gradient. You see, we have more rain in the north, up to thousand millimeter a year, and it goes down. Uh, this is the uh, coastal area, and we have very little rain in the desert. And to the left, you see the Israeli uh, rivers, and only those that are in the upper Jordan Valley, north of the Kinneret, are protected and are in good condition and healthy. All the rest, as you'll see in a minute, are affected. Those are the good streams uh, that we have above the, the Kinneret. The Kinneret is down here. All these are the healthy streams. And now this picture is uh, rather small. I received it from, uh, this is courtesy of the Ministry of the Environment, the, the Nature and Park Authority, and the Water Authority. So what, what you can see, I hope you can see, you see blue color, stream is blue color. Those are the healthy streams. All streams with different, other different colors are affected and are polluted. And you see that they are everywhere. So polluted streams are everywhere in Israel. Now here you see um, the density of the wastewater treatment plants. And you, as you will see in a minute, they are part of the problem, which makes it extremely difficult to restore and rehabilitate our stream. I will distinguish between restoration and rehabilitation later in this talk. So why is that so? Why are we in that state? Can this situation be changed? The inherent driver of environmental degradation everywhere is population growth. And Israel is leading the rest of the world in the rate of population increase. This is a major problem. We see it every day uh, uh, with the uh, traffic jam and all other aspects. Uh, so this effect, this caused decline of open land and increase of built areas. It caused increase of polluted potential an alteration of stream hydrological regime. It increases competition for water between nature and man. It increases demand for ecosystem services. There is more population. They want more parks. They more, want more nature to uh, enjoy. So all these together are really increase ecological pressure and stress on our stream and generally on nature. Now, it, is, it, is it unique to Israel? The answer is no, you know it in all your places. But the difference is that Israel is very small. I, think, I put here the picture of Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba, Canada. Uh, you're, the Canadians in the audience probably know Lake uh, Winnipeg itself is larger than all Israel. Uh, and as I said, the population is still growing at a very fast rate of 1.8% a year. Uh, so um, in this case, if this continues, I'm sorry to say we'll be in a very, very deep uh, problem, certainly, certainly in the quality of life uh, due to loss of nature. In 2020, Israel population is growing at, at the fast rate of the Western countries. I already, already said that. Israel population density is the third highest among developed countries. Israel is someplace here, uh, and it's 420 people per kilometer square. So the, the ultimate conclusion is that even a small change can have a large environmental effect. So I, I'm sure that the problems I mentioned before is not unique to Israel, but in those places where you have larger space, and I remember I've been in Manit I was invited uh, by the Ministry of the of Water uh, in Manitoba, and we flew for two hours over a forest. Uh, <laughs> this is something unimaginable for an Israeli. So uh, this is this is the problem, the population. So we are not doomed, as I said, but we must act sooner, faster, and make hard decision, including slowing population growth. And dear friends, I think this is our role as 
people who care for nature, people who care for the quality of life. There is no way around it. Israel is the homeland of all Jewish people, and there's no, no question about it. Uh, and if there is a problem someplace, and we don't know what will happen in Ukraine, and if Jews will need to come to Israel, we'll, we'll, we'll get them um, and hug them and, and, and make Israel home for them. But we need to know that there should be a, a, a control or certain limit to the rate of growth in this country. In 1950s, the population will be doubled in Israel. So imagine the problem we have now, how it will look in uh, 30 years. Now, there is a conflict of interest that limit stream rehabilitation. Others that I already mentioned, floods. Flood is considered something bad uh, that should be avoided, uh, but floods are the yearly reset mechanism of all Mediterranean rivers. Everywhere in, in the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean climate regions. So without flood, we don't have med rivers, and I will show you that in a minute. So there is a conflict of interest. Streams in Israel acts the receiving system for effluent resulting from breakdown of wastewater treatment plants. They are the lowest on, uh, on land. And if there is breakup or breakdown of, of a pipe or something in the system, they are the receiving system. So we may be 99% of the time we rehabilitated the stream. 99% of the time, it's OK. The 1% the that this happens, we lost everything. Stream in Israel are the receiving system for unused excess effluent. Israel is recycling. It's the leading uh, uh, in the world in recycling wastewater. However, we do have excess uh, water. We, we can impound everything and, and store it for a long period. And this causes a problem because it ends up in our streams. Now, there is a severe competition for fresh water. We should not forget we are a semi-arid country and fresh water is a limited resource and there is competition between nature and these streams are included and uh, human being. Now, let's understand that flood is the reset mechanism of med rivers every, every year. At the same time, flood threatened human life and property. Uh, this is the Armuk River that I, I took a picture on February 2003, and you see the tremendous, tremendous amount of water flowing in the stream. This is the Arcon River in a flat. No, it's not the Arcon. It's one of the uh, rivers in the in the um, north. And what I would like to show you the effects of flood, the ecological effects of flood, which depend on the frequency of the flood, on the intensity of the flood, the timing, and the duration. A flood restores channel connectivity. Uh, when it dries during summer completely or partly, uh, connectivity is, uh, um, it, uh, is not there anymore. And fl a flood restores the channel connectivity. It modifies channel morphology uh, and uh, by opening the, um, the sides of the streams. It restructure and expands habitat in the stream, especially more uh, running water habitats. It homogenizes water quality conditions. You know, a stream that starts at the head of the stream flowing down, let's say, all the way to the sea, it changes all the way down. But a flood homogenizes the water quality uh, all the way down and washes and uh, washes the stream. Uh, down. It at the same time, it redistributes material, resources, and biota. This is normal. It's not something bad. It's, it's positive. And overall, in med rivers, floods act as the yearly reset mechanism. Therefore, it is essential feature of med rivers. Now, I have to tell you that we have to fight with engineers and people who affect the drainage uh, systems uh, and they uh, fight floods. They don't want to see floods. They want to dam rivers, they want to build reservoirs. And for years, 
I'm trying to tell them that with no flood, we will not have healthy uh, Mediterranean rivers in our country. And there are, of course, some uh, problems. Sometimes it, it's fatal, and it's really uh, very sorry that we just had last year, a young couple took the elevator down to the basement and it was flooded and they drowned. So uh, this is indeed a problem and you know it, it, it's all over the world. But uh, unlike other parts of the world, floods are extremely important for Mediterranean rivers. Now, Israel is the leading, leading dwell in recycling and reclaimed wastewater, greater than 80%. Spain, which is the second one, is 25%. But there is still unused effluent and it is increasing. The streams pay a heavy toll, and this is what you see. This is the brown water. A flood just uh, flew in this stream, Hadera stream, but the effluent, the excess effluent, uh, is finding its way to the stream. And poor fish, there are dead fish. In this case, it was a, a breakdown of effluent distribution system in Lachish stream near Ashdod. Now, decline in the availability of water in streams. I show you a picture from the 1920s. This is the seven mills um, site, and you see the amount of water flowing through it. This picture was taken by, by my student, uh, today is a Dr. Jaron Hershkowitz in 2004 uh, and or five, and you see this is the same place, no water flowing. Now we have rehabilitated and we directed some water through here, but it doesn't look like that. There were 220 million cubic meter a year, and now it's less than one meter cubic a year um, in, in, in the Arcon. Uh, if this was not convincing, this is a picture <laughs> I'm standing. Uh, this is a picture from a reservoir uh, that was built on a stream a small stream in the Golan Heights called Bazelet Stream to collect its water and divert it for irrigation. This is the pipe for irrigation for agriculture, and this is the pipe for the stream. So there's an extreme competition for, the, for fresh water. Now, what do we mean by rehabilitation? This is something we should clarify. Is it the same as restoration? Is it the same as reclamation? In Hebrew, there is only one word, shikum, leshakel. Uh, handicapped people or people that were hurt in, a, in an accident, uh, we, anachnu meshakmim otam. This is the word, we rehabilitate them. Uh, but we should, we should use the richness of the English language uh, to have more precise termi terminology that I will show in a minute, particularly when we speak to engineers and planners. They need to know that shikum in Hebrew may mean different things uh, in reality. So let's see what it is. Uh, restoration and transformation, what I call the triple RT. This is the level of repair. This is what we do when we restore or rehabilitate. Um, and the, uh, we look at the biodiversity. Did we restore the biodiversity? Uh, the efforts on this scale, the efforts invested in time and money. The uh, smallest uh, effort is reclamation. This is more aesthetic. We had somebody dump the pile of garbage near the stream and we remove it. We reclaim the, the site. The next is rehabilitation, which actually is uh, repairing the stream in a way that it could continue to function and uh, as much as possible with the original fauna and flora. And restore is bringing the stream back to what it was. This is usually limited to nature reserves. If we had a catastrophe in a nature reserve, we will do our utmost to restore the original state and not uh, under constraint that we may have in rehabilitation. Now, many times I know this, 
that what engineers and planners call restoration or rehabilitation or reclamation, they use the word shikum, is not shikum. What they do is transformation. They take the stream and do something else in it. And uh, therefore, I introduced to this figure the level of transformation that, of course, we can put it to a scale of uh, low transformation level, high transformation level uh, is sometimes, for instance, this can uh, be in section of the stream, uh, uh, urban sections, that you want to do something to the stream to make it more um, available for recreation. But you change the system, you change the animals and plants in it, uh, it, it is a legitimate uh, action, but don't call this restoration or rehabilitation reclamation. This is transformation. Okay, except for nature reserve, where we wish to restore the original state, in most cases, we speak of rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is repairing the system structurally and functionally under constraints. The concern is we may not have all the water that was before, and many other conditions may have changed. Nevertheless, we want to repair it to the extent that it can maintain a long-term healthy ecosystem based as much as possible on original communities. I want to stress it is not gardening. What is gardening? I plant a plant in my garden, uh, seasonal or not, or, or yearly, and it dies. So I put another plant. I put, I put fish in the stream and they died. Somebody will say, okay, what is the problem? Put the fish again. No, this is not uh, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation should let the fish reproduce and um, uh, have healthy population. Repairing a polluted stream is to a large extent straightforward that any one of the audience can say it, simply stop polluting. Um, achieving this goal is based on the extent of the success of minimizing or stopping the pollution. Now, however, as you already know, in Israel, we have problem. In Israel, there are, uh, uh, we need, okay, there, there's a mistake in this sentence. We need to overcome three major obstacles. First, presently, the streams are the ultimate receiving water, for the for effluent resulting from breakdown of water, wastewater treatment plant. Actually, it's inherent in the design of the wastewater treatment plant that the overflow will go to a channel that end up in a stream. So this is a handicap, inherent handicap in our planning. Uh, there is excess of effluent uh, because there is the population increase. There is more water use, there is more effluent that, that agri agri agriculture can take and use, and therefore the excess ends up in the stream. And the third one, in certain instance, instances, it is uncontrolled cross-boundary problems with effluent introduced to Israel from Palestinian territory. By no means I want to blame this as being the most important, but we shouldn't neglect the, for instance, the Alexander stream received from Tulkarn and Nablus, uh, uh, low quality uh, water uh, from, from their territory. Presently, there is a committee of experts headed by the Water Authority. I'm part of this committee, committee to find an immediate solution to handle the excess effluent. One of the options considered is to sacrifice two to three streams to which the excess effluent will be discharged to and save the others. Uh, another alternative is to discharge it directly to the sea, the sea via a pipe. So far, conflict of interest between the stream expert and the sea expert hold the solution. The stream experts say, not in my yard, uh, the same say the sea experts. So there is a stalemate in this connection. I have suggested a th a, actually a third option, take the excess effluent 
to the desert where it will cause minimum or no harm and may even be beneficial. They all accepted it, but they look, we are, we are looking for immediate, uh, immediate answer. So this option was set aside for the time being, claimed to be a long-term solution rather than immediate one that is needed now. I disagree with this statement, but this is what other people in the committee think. Hydrological repair of system. Now how we repair the hydrology that was altered. Hydrological repair of streams that were devoid of their water sources is also a complex and conflicting task. Um, under the condition of water scarcity, which is the reality in Israel, there is an inherent conflict of interest between men and nature, as I already mentioned. And here I show you just an example that say it all. This is a, a, a Betzat stream, which is in a nature reserve, pumping of water at the upper drainage basin simply lowered the um, groundwater and the spring stopped flowing and the stream dried to the extent that water we needed to bring water in a pipe to keep the community at the minimum level until we find another solution. So this is an outcome of severe competition for the water. Now in 1924, um, Israel uh, had an ordinance of nature's right for water. And um, this, it was approved in 19, uh, 2000, 2004, allocating, I added insufficient 50 million cubic meter. This means that the Jordan River received nothing um, because it requires many times more than 50 million cubic meters. And uh, even this uh, uh, allocation was not implemented or fully implemented uh, and it yet to be proven because we had drought years and again, the competition for the water uh, prevented from allocating the uh, water to the streams. But this is the policy paper, an important one, which may be in your country is uh, absolutely uh, understood uh, in our country. It wasn't. Uh, I remember when I started to work on the stream and I came to the water authority and I said, we need to save the stream, please release the springs to the streams. And they, I got an answer. If the stream wants the water, the stream should pay, which is of course uh, foolish, but and now they don't think like that anymore. And the policy paper is one of the actions taken. I think, uh, excuse me, it, about five minute warning, okay? Thank you very much. Thank no you very much. I needed it. A potential, a potential solution is to reconstruct the original hydrological hydrograph, meaning the flow regime with less water. And um, we need to know what characterized Med River hydrograph. So I show you what is not a Mediterranean climate hydrograph. This is in Oklahoma, which may have rain a different time of the year and it's irregular pattern. However, in Med Rivers, this is the Hashafet stream in Israel and this is Big Sulphur, Big Sulphur Creek in California. You see, they have exactly the same pattern, uh, a Mediterranean uh, climate river. So we just describe it. This is two consecutive years in Ashofet stream. And you see the pattern increase of the uh, discharge and then decline. In this case, it may dry out. Again, increase in the following year and drying out. It doesn't need to dry out completely, depends on the river. So. Uh, the Med River hydrograph may be reconstructed by differential allocation of water from springs during spring and summertime. And I will show you what, what I mean. In white, you see the historic hydrograph, and in, uh, in yellow, the impaired one. Now, this period here is extremely important biologically. There is plenty of water, but not uh, scarring a flow. 
So this is a period that we call the window of opportunity for biological recovery of the plants and animals in the stream. You see it's missing in the yellow completely. Uh, so what we do is we have a water table. We don't need to add water in winter. God is taking care of that. And we start in spring, more water and then decline uh, slowly uh, putting less and less water and we get a reconstructed hydrograph, which mimics the original one. Um, I'm finishing. We will not talk about global warming, but it's extremely important. It affects the system. And uh, I will leave this for another time. And finally, in conclusion, the government is presently more aware of the problems and the needs. The Ministry of the Environment is promoting rehabilitation or re uh, uh, projects mostly reducing pollution and rehabilitation of the stream corridor, which are the sides of the stream. And you see one, the Surek Stream Estuary National Park. Um, and we are talking about SPNI. SPNI is extremely active in streams. They have a special stream team uh, that together in cooperation with uh, Nature and Park Authority, the advancing public and government awareness for the action programs needed. And this is one of the documents, um, longing, my transliteration, longing for a stream, current state and plan for hydrological and ecological rehabilitation by uh, the major author was Orit Skotelsky in 2012. What she did is compilation of scientific information mostly research conducted by the academia in Israel. I have, I take the blame for at least part of that. And this, you see, there are many, many documents. You don't need to read it. This is the SBNI one. And um, so what I can say is many documents have been produced, but changes of stream reality is lacking behind. Thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you very much, Professor. Very, very interesting. I learned a lot and uh, people enjoyed it. There's lots to talk about. There's a very lively chat going on in the chat feature, uh, but I will start with the questions. Uh, there's only officially a few of them, uh, but I will just say something uh, something to start with as well <clears throat> on a related SPNI topic. Thank you very much for mentioning uh, SPNI's work in a general sense on rivers. And I'll just mention that in terms of wetland habitats in Israel in general, freshwater wetland habitats, uh, of course, Israel, we've begun uh, an incredibly uh, new and innovative rewilding project of wetland habitats. Uh, on your, I think about it, Dan alone speaks a lot about uh, in, in a recent piece on channel, uh, on the Channel 11 news, the nightly news on Friday night, uh, he said in a quote, and we're getting this, uh, this good nine minute video translated and probably get it out and online uh, and linked for you, everybody uh, next week. Uh, he said that, uh, you know, we can't really talk about shikum. It was in Hebrew, uh, whether he meant rehabilitation or reclamation. He said, uh, there's nothing to lishakem anymore. Uh, some uh, 80 or 90% of the wetland habitats, uh, the marshes and uh, swamps in Israel uh, that were existing a hundred years ago no longer exist. And so what we can do is we can rewild. And he mentioned a new Hebrew word, hit parut, in, uh, with an aleph, not an ayin. With an ayin, it means rioting, and we know that well. But hit parut, rewilding is something we're doing. Uh, we're, we're turning former agricultural lands, fish ponds, sometimes fields, uh, into uh, wetland nature reserves, uh, mm -hmm. benefit the bird migration and all of the uh, biota uh, that uh, the wetland habitats can provide. So thank Jay, you. Jay, Jay, this is parallel to restoring under constraint, meaning rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So it is more, it's closer to rehabilitation, making it uh, available for wildlife. So th therefore it's extremely important and the nature, uh, uh, the society for uh, uh, part. Hmm? Okay. Part, uh, is, is leading in that. The right. SPNI, this is, I missed the word. The SPNI is, is leading in that. Thanks, thanks. To me, it would seem rewilding would be the highest form of the returning into its original state, but um, 
whatever. We can talk about that at another point. We'll stick to the riparian habitats of the Mediterranean climate streams. And by the way, I have a question. Maybe you'll answer. You know, uh, excuse me, Jay. Uh, Professor Gazit, can you please stop uh, the screen sharing? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Avi. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what, why, what the difference is between a river and a stream, even in your definition, that makes the Jordan and the Arcone rivers, but the rest of them streams. Um, but let's get to, if, if, if that comes up, you can answer it or if it's interesting, but otherwise, um, let's just get to the questions in the, uh, in the chats here, which I just lost. Okay, <clears throat> let's be, be quick. Try to just give me a one sentence answer because there's a few questions here and then there's a lot more questions in the chat and some issues that have come up. That people are chatting about. But in terms of questions, once a low oxygen species takes over, can we reverse this process uh, by increasing oxygen content or does it take stronger measures? Uh, it's a, a very good question, but it, it's a re reversible. Uh, high oxygen level um, gives an opportunity for the less tolerant species, the more sensitive, to come in. And they remove the uh, more tolerant species because they don't have an advantage anymore. They had advantage when there was low oxygen. When we rehabilitate the stream and there is high oxygen level, they will disappear. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so if uh, here's a big question, answer in a sentence, please. If population growth is the problem, can Israel sustain its status as a beacon of Aliyah in a safe haven for the Jewish people? Are we just gonna run out of room for people here? I don't think we, we will run out of room for, for people. We can have high rise and we can build in the desert. But the, the question is the quality of life. Uh, what I'm, I'm, I fear that we will lose the young people. They will say, <laughs> we don't want to live in this kind of situation. We have an option to go someplace else. So we have to think about that. It's not an easy answer, uh, but uh, it's not the actual space that uh, we will not have it's the quality of life. Yeah, and um, and meanwhile, uh, you know, the Jews are uh, most of the Jewish populations that are going to move here on mass have probably moved here already. So we see a high population growth, but uh, I'm not sure the ma massive ways of Aliyah are in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, has lower river flows in, in resulted in seawater encroachment inland? Uh, yes, this is something natural in, uh, in Israel. There is a um, uh, rise and fall of the sea level, which introduces the water into the uh, lower part of the stream, and the fauna and flora are typical of that, that condition. So it's something normal uh, that we have in all our coastal streams. Um, Avital, I think your colleague David Firth, if I recall your greeting in the yes. beginning, you've touched on what is one of my talking points, and I think one of the more important issues that we face here that we should deal with is, has desalinization helped the med streams in Israel and their biodiversity? Uh, yes, salinization is the uh, silent pollutant. I, when I talk no, about- No, 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 has it helped? Has it helped is the question. Salinization? De desalinization. Ah, desalinization, okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, yes, of course, because it can replace or replenish rather the uh, aquifer, the groundwater with fresh water and make springs uh, flow again. So without it, we would have been in, in a major and uh, even catastrophic situation. At the moment we have enough uh, water, drinking water, desalinized water that can maintain our uh, drinking needs. And this we, now we are in the process of releases, releasing springs to the streams, uh, and in this case, it, it is a true rehabilitation. And is that expected to, to grow and increase both the desalinization and the return of springs to nature? Yeah, there, there is a connection between the two. Uh, when we continue to build a desalination plant and we have more desalinized water, then we can release more uh, springs that were pumped for human use. Mm -hmm. um, a quick question, I don't think I'm gonna ask you this, uh, this is for our previous guest, uh, a member of Knesset Alon Tal, who spoke about this issue. How would it be possible to reduce the rate of population growth? Let's not, unless you have a quick... No, the only thing I can say, this was a taboo for many, many years. 
And now with the, I'm sure if Alon talked to you, he talked to you about our special forum uh, about this, uh, people start to talk about this and, and decision makers start to mention it. So slowly it comes to uh, people's idea that we have to talk about it. At the moment, we, there is no action, uh, but uh, you know, things start first that um, you are aware that you have yeah. a problem and then you think about what we can do about it. Thank you. Um, uh, David is asking, I'll, I'll combine the questions. Was the Hula an example of restoration, reclamation or rehabilitation? <laughs> it was really neither of, it was some, it was reconstruction of something new because there was a marsh and there was a lake and what was reconstructed was a marsh at the, at the location of the lake. So <laughs> it is something new, nevertheless, it's extremely important. I just want to take the opportunity and tell you that if we were smart, uh, smart, sorry, if we were smart in the 50s, in the mid 50s, not to drain the hula, we would have Africa, Asia, in Europe, in one side. It would would have been a major touristic place with economic uh, benefit, which you you cannot imagine. But at that time, 50% of the experts said, let's drive because the soil, we need the soil. And the others say no. And what happened, we lost the marsh that was the filter to the, to the King Herod. And uh, it turned out that the soil, the, the peat soil is not a good soil for growing things. So uh, we lost on both sides, but we have no one to blame for. Uh, now we know that we shouldn't do it. We, these days we are fighting for the last marsh in the uh, coastal plain, the Poleg Marsh. David probably knows what I'm talking about because they want to have a road, a major road crossing. And we are finding it, the, the uh, SBNI is the leading uh, group the, with the Nature and Park Authority and I'm helping them. I wrote a letter to the ministry, to the relevant ministries about it. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but you you started you said before. Well, we have nobody to blame for this full of tragedy, and then you didn't really finish the sentence. I think you were going to say, "But ourselves." But but I would say, yeah, we have nobody to blame except everybody except SPNI, whose whose foundation story was exactly in saying that at, in real time. Incredibly the founder, prescient. Uh, the founder Amot Zahavi, the founder or one of the founders of the SPNI. Um, really started the whole thing with the Hula Reserve and uh, uh, they wanted to save the marsh and the lake, but uh, people ha didn't have the vision how it will look like and uh, we lost it. Yeah. It, it's really tra a tragedy for us. Yeah. 1953, this was, the, uh, this was a decade before environmental consciousness took over America, Absolutely. for example. Absolutely. Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1961. But before that, you know, so, you know, go us. And, and, and anyway, uh, a partially answered all of this is a, is a, is a network of, of a recreated wetland habitats uh, in artificial former, former fish ponds uh, throughout North and Central Israel. So uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the weeks and months to come. Um, can effluent be sent to the Dead Sea? the wastewater treatment effluent can be sent to the Dead Sea. Okay, there is there is a plan. Some people say that we can do it, but I think that messing up with the Dead Sea uh, may, may be a, a wrong solution uh, because you don't know how, what will be the response of the ecosystem. Even bringing the uh, red sea water into the Dead Sea uh, we fear will change uh, the ecosystem, uh, the hypersaline ecosystem of the Dead Sea, and uh, the sea may turn red uh, instead of uh, blue white that it is today. So I, I would stay away from messing with the, uh, with the Dead Sea. Um, do, uh, does Israel use, uh, uh, use marshes to help treat effluent of uh, that comes out of the wastewater treatment plant? No, no, unfortunately, we don't have large enough areas. What we use is constructed wetlands. Constructed wetlands 
is really parallel to the natural marshes that this is how it all started that all of a sudden they noticed that when the effluent go through the marsh it it, it 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 comes out clean so based on this the whole idea of um constructed wetland which are much smaller and you can make it modular uh, uh, with uh, uh, flowing vertical flow horizontal flow impounding the water on a small scale and uh, get get an answer what i okay okay go cool. yeah quick quick we're, we're we're about at the top of the hour now so if anybody's got to leave uh we're probably going to be losing people soon uh thank you very much willing to go on a couple more minutes here and then answer just three or four more questions i will do it quickly uh, so thank everybody for joining. Everybody, uh, please stay on for the next few minutes if you can, and I'll get to these next couple questions here in the question and answer. For everybody that wrote them in the chat uh, and didn't get a question answered, uh, sorry about that, but uh, people got smart and started writing in the in the question and answers as we were talking. So um, uh, what about expanding and improving existing wastewater treatments plants? Is that being considered? Uh, can, will you repeat, please? Expanding and improving the existing WWTP. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's being improved all the time. The problem is they need a storage reservoir by the plant for if there is a mishap for 24, 72 uh, uh, hours. Uh, right. They can store the water and then take it back instead of releasing it to the street. Mm -hmm. So the answer is really simple, but the problem is space, land. Um, how, what do you feel about the Red Dead connection? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on that. The only thing I know is that changing the concentration of salts in the Dead Sea may change the ecosystem completely, and it may turn out to be something that will be sorry for that. Yeah. So I know that there are big plans of desalination using this system, and it may work, but we should be ready that we may have some other problems arising uh, in face of unknowns uh, that we still have. I think that's a fair, a fair consensus in the biodiversity community in Israel, that, that approach. Um, um, uh, is Israel, since Israel's economy is less dependent on agriculture now than it used to be, doesn't that mean less pollution for the rivers? No, actually it's uh, vice versa, it's reversed. We need the agriculture to use the excess effluent. If not for agriculture, we would stay with all the effluent. And uh, no, we still need agriculture, not only for taking the effluent uh, or using the effluent, but also uh, to be attached to the land, and especially in the periphery of the country, by the borders, we need to see that we are there not only with houses, but also with agriculture. And we need to be uh, independent in producing all the products. So we certainly need agriculture. Interesting. Okay, and a final question, uh, which I think is a good question to end with. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting. Uh, are all those countries that are in the same Mediterranean climate zones that you showed before, is there any working together cooperative projects uh, on this issue? Yes, yes, we do. And as a, as a matter of fact, myself with a, co a colleague in Berkeley, we're the first one to write a paper on what are Mediterranean climate streams. And then the issue was, and this, gathered a lot of scientists who were working on Mediterranean climate stream, but didn't know that, <laughs> that they, they are working on a special system. They treated the, the rivers uh, as they know them. And then the, this issue was revisited uh, 10 years later, and we will do it again every 10 years to see where we are and what we know and how we should improve uh, the state of the streams. I just will mention last word, intermittent streams that are dry in summer, which are found in all Mediterranean climate streams were left behind. And they are coming up front uh, due to the fact that people started to look what are Mediterranean climate streams. Well, I think you just gave us the sequel to this, to this topic, to this lecture right now. I think we need another webinar on intermittent streams. 
Yes, that is a fascinating. It's taking topic. over. It's taking over all over the world. I have to say, those that have intermittent streams. Seriously, we'll keep you posted, okay, uh, Professor Gazit. We'll we'll okay. book you in another couple months or something. <laughs> okay. And uh, we'll keep we'll keep everybody posted. Uh, there was a lively chat going on. I think the chat is being saved as well. So uh, I don't know. We can get in and look at it. But if you have questions for uh, Professor Gazit that you have not been that have not been answered, contact me uh, or Barry at uh, the S S P at the S P N I info or Robin or Avi in, uh, in the states or in Canada, and um, we will answer your questions. So thank you very much. Shavuot thank Tov to everybody. Toda Toda Raba, Professor Gazit. Yeah. And to Da, a lot of thanks to you. You are really important to us. Very nice. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Oh, okay. uh, thanks and goodbye, uh, Leon Russell, and uh, all of our uh, board members all over the place from from, and all of you from all over the world. At least three or four continents made up here. So appreciate it, guys. See you in a couple weeks. Next webinar is with Noam Weiss, uh, the very uh, charismatic uh, director of our birding center in a lot. And he's going to be talking about uh, birds as biological pest control and other fascinating uh, cross-border topics of his work in a lot. So thanks very much. See you guys two weeks from today, same time. Bye bye. bye all bye the time. best. All the best to all of you. Bye, bye everybody.